um, I think the, the British government took a, I mean, it, it was really controversial, the amount of aid that they gave to Cunard. Um, I mean, the, 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 the funds that basically went to, um, to Cunard, I, I think it was something like 13 times the company's profit for 1901. Um, and, you know, so you're then talking sort of the following year, the year after. Um, they would never have been able to raise that money, you know, commercially. I mean, they, they paid an interest rate of two and three quarter percent. Um, they'd have easily had to pay four and a half percent, you know, if, if, if they raised the funds privately. So, um, yeah, government, the government aid just wasn't, wasn't an option. Um, and yeah, I, I think it, I think it does reinforce this whole thing that actually, you know, speed is not, um, it, 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 it's not commercially viable really, and, unless you have that subsidy. Um, I mean, one of the things, I don't think people realize just how much space is taken up by, you know, the engine rooms you need, the boiler rooms you need, the coal bunkers, um, you know, the, 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 the accommodation for all the crew, all the firemen, all the trimmers that need to, you know, to, to, to operate all of this. Um, and it's a striking thing, actually, that if you if you basically look at a ship as a commercial um, as a commercial unit, um, Lusitania and Mauritania were smaller than Adriatic. You know, so don't get me wrong, the gross tonnage, Lusitania and Mauritania, they're they're significantly bigger. They're 31, 32,000 gross tons, and Adriatic is less than 25,000. But when you make allowance for all the space that is taken up by all the boiler rooms and all the coal bunkers and so on, on Lusitania and Mauritania, there was actually more space on Adriatic that they could use for, you know, for passengers or for cargo. So actually a, a slower ship, um, it, it's not just more economical, but the, the, there's a great competitive advantage there because you've, you've, you've actually got a ship that's smaller but for commercial purposes, that there's actually more space available. So it's a it's a remarkable thing, just, just how much space is basically eaten up by um, you know by the uh, by the, the boiler and engine rooms. So uh, if I had to choose a company, I'll just uh, to stay on. Even though White Star had a lot of disasters, I would still choose White Star because they did not go for speed; they went for luxury. I'd rather spend one or two more days on a ship and being like completely relaxed, you know, not worrying about, okay, I don't have to be here until like, you know, two or three days. So I can spend like an extra one or two days on a ship as long as I'm comforted. I, there's plenty of things for me to do on a ship. I was reading on The Only Way to Cross. I have a copy of John Max Tolan Graham's book. And um, he That's said, even more, even more tame with the beautiful ships, he wasn't particularly particularly that luxurious as some people may seem to think. To me, her interiors were beautiful. Not as good as Aquitania's or Lusitania's, but they were still very beautiful to me. Yeah, I, I think, um, I don't know, I, I think Aquitania, yes, Aquitania was a bit more Lusitania-like in terms of the, the decor. Um, you know, sort of the, the lighter um, interiors. Um, but yeah, I do like the I do like the wood and everything on Mauritania. And I think we'd probably have a different perception today if you know if we had color photos. You know, and if they were lit uh, lit properly. Oh, nice cat. Um, and um, yeah, um, I, I think that's uh, I think that's true. Um, I mean, one of the one of the things Cunard were a bit wary of with that with Aquitania was, I think, the original design for her first class grill room. Um, it, it was similar in many ways to Olympic's first class dining saloon or reception room, um, and it was July nineteen thirteen, I think it was, and Cunard 
they basically saw the ceiling design for this room and thought, no, we can't have this. It looks too similar to Olympics. Um, and the finished product looks very similar to Olympic anyway. Um, so I, I, it almost makes you think, well, the, the original design must have been a, almost a carbon copy. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think, and you know, there are certain points of comparison. I mean, Aquitania, she had a swimming pool. Um, she didn't have a Turkish bath or squash court. I mean, Turkish bath wasn't the original design. Um, or at least in 1912, but you know they didn't follow through with it. Um, for Lusitania and Mauritania, there are all these amenities on Olympic that um, you know they they just didn't have. Um, so I, I think there's really you, you do really see a step up just in the kind of luxury, um, and. Um, and yeah, I, I, you, you just think, well, the, the amount of upgrades they did over the years to, to try and, you know, stay competitive is, you know, a, a new ship, it'll be at its peak, you know, the first couple of years after it enters service. I think Oceanic, her peak was 1904. So you sort of have four or five years of success and then it's gradually downhill, um, you know, as, as new competitor ships are built and brought into service. So um, you, you do really see that changing with, um, you know, and comparing Aquitania to Mauritania, for example. Reminds me of the Imperator class because um, not even like a year later, you know, two years later at the Olympic was in service, the, the uh, Germans of the, uh, of the handbag line, they built the, the, uh, the Imperator, and with all her crazy features that they had to redo, uh, Cunard had to redo after the war, she was a very luxurious ship. I mean, her her swimming pool was just uh, like 10 times the step up of Olympics, and you're like, within a year, you're like, what in the world? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, White Star, they, they kind of fixed it to a point on Britannic because those mm -hmm. swimming pools can be fitted out much better than Olympics. But it was the same, it was otherwise the same pool, you know, they, they didn't um, make a change like that. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just really remarkable. You, you often hear, you know, you see photos of, um, you know, some of the interiors on some of these liners. And, um, you know, you, you you hear it said, oh, you wouldn't tell, you wouldn't know you're aboard a ship. Um, I think that's really true for Imperator's swimming pool. I mean, you know, you've, you've got those huge columns. I mean, I, th I think it's several decks high. It's just, um, it's just utterly remarkable. Um, and I think, but then, you, you know, they did, they did go overboard. I mean, the, the, there's that quote, um, you know, the Imperator, she was a first-rate hotel, but a third-rate ship. Um, and um, they did have to do... Yes, yeah, she, she, she listed a fair bit. They had to make quite a few changes, and Cunard had to fix quite a few things after the war. Um, so I, I think in terms of... I, I suppose just she'd say that the, the, the technical design in, in, in many ways, I, th I think Olympic, she's, she's more conservative design, but I, I think the design lasted, um, lasted better. Um, and there the, the was, um, there was an article in, um, in a journal quite a few years back and it was from someone, I think it was the finance chief of the Hamburg America line. And he basically said that, you know, Imperata, she's so large and expensive um, and expensive to run that he didn't actually think she would make much money. Um, so it's, it's, it's obviously great in terms of all that magnificence, but White Star were a bit more conservative and possibly they, uh, they had a better idea of, um, of what would make money for them. Um, but then again, um, you know, Imperator, when she ran for Cunard after the war, she was very successful and profitable. So, um, you know, who knows? I, I don't know. I don't know what figures the the the, um, the the German company were working off. So, 
Um, we'd like to welcome um, one of our other admin team members. This is Nigel Bryant. He's coming to us from New Zealand. Um, he's also um, in Fox Star Line. He's part of the Fox Star Line admin team and the RMS Titanic Reflections admin team. Hi, Nigel. He's still getting connected oh, yeah. here. <laughs> we told our admin team they were welcome to join us um, if the opportunity presented itself, um, if they had any questions for you. <laughs> it looks like he's having a hard time I'm oh, connecting. Possibly, possibly so lost. He may be back. I don't know what time it is. Yeah, what time is it in New Zealand? I'm not I sure. I don't know, it's probably tomorrow. That's probably what's tomorrow. like, <laughs> I'm always joking around with Nigel. I'm like, he lives in the future because it's like tomorrow there probably. Oh, goodness. I think it is, it's two o'clock. So it's probably very early in the morning uh, on uh, Saturday. <laughs> it did, did look like it might be daylight. I'm not sure. Isn't that crazy? So it's, so Mark, it's probably Friday night for you. Yeah. Friday afternoon for me, and it's probably Saturday morning for Nigel, if he can ever make it back. There he is. Hi, Nigel. We're just talking about what time it is. So it's like, it's Saturday morning for you, right? Yeah? Are you there, Nigel? Hi. Are you muted? Can you hear us? Are you able to talk to us? Hi. Nigel. <laughs> it says connecting. It's, I think it's connecting. Oh. Well, Nigel has a really cool Titanic collection. He has all kinds of cool models and really nice books. He probably has some of your books. <laughs> I'm still trying, trying to, um, to build my library. I have like um, probably a little over 200 Titanic books now. Oh, goodness. That's a lot more than me. Oh, I tend to find shelves. Way lot more than me. You know, they go saggy and stuff. You need a. Oh, proper. I have to put the heavy ones on the, the bottom, like the ship magnificent books. They now have to be on the bottom shelf because my my shelves were starting to like bow in a little bit. I was like, uh oh, <laughs> they need to go on the bottom. <laughs> yeah, they're really. I was seeing, I was foreseeing like you know some serious accident happening. So um, the heavy Titanic books are now on the bottom shelf in my, I used to have a dining room. Um, I, that's a good question. Mark, do you have like stuff? Because I find that most Titanic people or even just ocean liner people in general, we have like um, collections. Um, Nigel does it, um, Sarah and Kipfer do it. I do it, I have stuff like Titanic stuff. And I have, I even have a big piece of Olympic wood and stuff. What do you have? I don't, I don't have a lot really. Well, actually, I don't have a dining room. I live in quite a small, quite a small house. Um, I do have a bit of Britannic wood from, um, uh, I think it's the architrave from um, the um, forward staircase. Um, got a feeling it's from B or C deck, um, but I need to, um, need to check. Um, so that's, that's probably the biggest um, big, biggest thing I've, I've got I've got in my collection, um, and you know I do have various postcards and brochures and things, um, but I'm not, I'm not really a collector to be honest. I, I tend to, if I have something, it's usually if I can use it in a book. So, I just ordered some Britannic wood. Now mine is like the size of the end of my pinky, oh. and I'm not even going to talk about how much it costs. Yeah. I think but it's I wanted... inflation. Yeah, well, and it's coming from the UK, so the the tiny piece of wood plus the shipping. No, I, we won't speak of it. But no. um, but now I'll have a piece of I I'll have Titanic coal, Titanic rust, a large piece of Olympic wood, and then this tiny little piece of Britannic wood. But I'll have a piece from all three ships. So, I feel like my life's you know pretty squared away now. Um, <laughs> Nigel, welcome, my friend. Are you awake? Is it very early in the morning? Yes, Nigel. We're live, right? We're not just seeing ghosts. We're live. Can you hear us, Nigel? Can you hear us, my friend? Hi. Can you hear us, Nigel? Yeah. 
Nigel. Nigel, can you hear us? Yes. Nigel, okay. You can't connect to the audio. Do the chat. Um, so, Mark, um, have you ever been to like the Queen Mary, the SS United States, or have you ever been to the States at all? Um, I went to went to Florida, Florida? when I was, um, I don't know how old, maybe 12, 13. Um, and, you know, kind of did, um, so it was around, it was around Orlando. You know, so kind of did Universal Studios, um, Kennedy Space Center. Um, where else? <laughs> all, basically, all the all the tourist um, uh, wet and wild. You know, all the various touristy places um, <clears throat> for, for the best part of a week, I think. So, um, yeah, I, I just I just remember being absolutely stuffed full because the the meals were just. The meals were just huge and, you know, almost like I had to order, uh, you know, child's portions, even though, you know, at the sort of 13, it was kind of, it was kind of having, kind of had adult sized meals by UK standards. But, you know, if you ordered that in Florida, you just, you just get this massive plate with stuff and, you know, just piled up and just got this memory of, you know, trying to, trying to finish meals and you know food was are you well, saying that american good. portions are huge <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, southern here in the south southern american portions especially okay okay uh. in the south, adult portions i just man i went to a restaurant a mexican restaurant i said yes i just have a plate of nachos the nachos are like Probably like four plates full. I'm like this. You expect me to eat this? <laughs> yeah, I suppose you can get a dog pack or something to take it home. But um. take it home. Okay. Um, anyway, Mark, are you working on anything new right now? Um, can we expect any new books or documentaries or anything like that? Oh, um, there's uh, there's one or two possible um, things in the works for um, you know. Uh, documentaries but nothing nothing confirmed as yet so I don't want to say anything in case I jinx it <laughs> um, I did do a recent um, lecture um, for the public record office of Northern Ireland with the Belfast Titanic Society um, and that it that apparent I think it's been uploaded onto YouTube um, to within the last day or so so um, okay. that was um, a couple of months ago so that's new. Not not many people would have seen that unless they unless they were there on the night. Um, so uh, that's there. And I'm working on a few articles and things. Um, and I do have a book idea, but um, it's just it's just taking time. I think it's just going to end up being a very long book. So I wouldn't wouldn't count on it for a couple of years anyway. Well, okay, I Nigel's just... audio is not working. He said to tell you hi, and he's a huge fan of your books. Oh hi! <laughs> His you. audio is not working. He's he's getting ready for work. Oh so. okay. Oh work <laughs> on a Saturday. Oh goodness. Oh, I know how that is. I work in retail as well. So. Yeah. Um, oh. Well, I I I used to work Saturdays, so not uh, um, not good. Yes. So you mentioned um, the documentaries. Um, you've been at a few. I know I've seen you pop up up in a few of them. Um, is there a favorite one or is there one that you like enjoyed um you know working on you know the most oh goodness i'm not sure um well i i, I never tend to I, I don't tend to watch documentaries or things that i'm in <laughs> so so um that kind of that kind of limits things a bit well is there one that you enjoyed working on maybe not watching so much but is yeah. there one that you enjoyed like actually working on there, there was there was a French one which was um, I was translated into French so uh, I have no idea what I said. <laughs> um, and um, oh, we've lost Nigel again. 
Yeah, he said he had to go to work and it was nice oh, seeing everyone. And he'll watch us all. He'll, he said he'd watch us later. <laughs> I could have called him sick or something. I don't know. <laughs> I suppose if you're in New Zealand, you can't say you've got COVID because it's fine. No. <laughs> um, you're not sick. I'm, I'm not endorsing ringing in sick to work when you're not sick, by the way. <laughs> I, don't anyone, I don't think anyone should ever do that. Only if um, you want to talk to Mark Turnside. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, don't do that. Um, oh, I, yeah. So what we were talking about documentary. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't I'm not sure if I really have a favourite. I'm trying to remember the different ones. I, I did quite enjoy doing one called Titanic Connections, which um, was quite a few years back. I think it was about 2011 or something like that. Um, um, and um, it was shown, um, I think, in the UK and Ireland. I'm not sure if it aired in the States or Canada, maybe Europe. I'm not sure. Um, and that um, included, um, you know, um, sort of distant, distant relatives. So um, members of the families of, um, uh, you know, um, the, the, the Pirries, Andrews and so on. So um, that was, um, that was very, uh, that was very interesting. Oh, cool. um, and, you know, a, a lot of people, they, they don't necessarily know the family history. I mean, Thomas Andrews' brother, um, was the prime minister of Northern Ireland in oh. the um, in the 1940s? I, I think it, I think it was 1940 to 43 or 44, something like that. So, you know, a, a lot of this was um, well, all of this was during the um, the, the Second World War, um, and um, you know, you, it, it's quite interesting. You see, you can see some of the clips, the the, 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 the newsreels, or, or what have you, um, that are. Uh, that are online um, and you know to hear him speak and you kind of think well Thomas Andrews would have sounded like that and you then compare it to some of the portrayals in various films and so on and you just think well, it's completely different they haven't got that right um, so there's a lot a lot of the family history is you know is, is quite interesting um, and, and Piri, Lord Piri of course died in 1924 and he was still working um, and Harland and Wolf really was in a bit of a mess financially and uh, after he passed on and I don't think he was a great one for succession planning um, and um, you know his, his wife um, lived on I think to 1935, 36 or something like that and um, she did have um, she did have a habit of you know telling people how poor she was and um, you know that she, she she didn't have um, didn't have money to kind of um, keep her in the manner that she was accustomed to. Um, but um, there was a letter I can't, I can't remember who it was from actually, but they were saying, well, you know, Lady Piri, she says she's poor, but she's not. So it was basically saying politely, don't believe it. <laughs> um, so it's quite a lot of the family history is is interesting as well. Um, and of course, you know, we often, if you're just looking at Titanic, you kind of focus on these people just as they were in 1912 and not, you know, the years before or the years afterwards. Um, you know, people don't realise Ismay's daughter was married in March 1912, you know, just before Titanic sailed. <clears throat> so if you're looking at the months before Titanic's maiden voyage, I'm sure he was much more excited about his daughter's wedding than than sailing on Titanic. Um, so yeah, you, you get to know the family histories and that's um, that's always interesting. I just recently saw you in a doc documentary. I can't remember which one it was though. Um, you were walking around outside and it was all oh, like- At Southampton. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely. It was one with Lawrence Fishburne, wasn't it? Yes, that's the one. That's it was, it was freezing cold. On it, I was absolutely it cold. <laughs> honestly, and we had to we'd had to do so many different takes, and it was it was really windy. That the wind was just cut you like a knife. It was it was absolutely freezing cold. This wind, um, I, I had I was I was given an extra sort of puffer jacket or coat to put on as well, and every time I said something, I was just thinking, I hope this is the final take. Because I think we had to do it six, seven, eight, or even nine times. 
and uh, I knew you weren't going to say that one was your favorite because it looked really miserable. <laughs> it, it was just a dull day and it, it started pouring with rain just as soon as we'd finished. So actually timing wise, we were all right. And then I had to rush to catch my train from Southampton. But th this was February last year. So actually it was just, it was kind of just before, it was That's kind of like things were normal. That was, when did that come out? That just came out um, a couple of months ago, didn't it, on the History Channel? Or am I just really behind seeing it? I don't um, know. I think, yeah, I think it was a couple of months. I think it was two or three months back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, one of my friends texted me. It's just like, oh, I've seen you on the telly. <laughs> Are you sure? I love your accent. <laughs> Saw you on the telly. <laughs> I love it. Well, I felt bad for you. I was like, oh my gosh, he looks... That just looks so miserable outside. <laughs> yeah, we did do indoor filming as well. That was uh, that was all right, but it's always the way. I think we're filming for probably three or four hours, and you know that'll apply to each person that was interviewed for the documentary. So oh, I know Charles goodness. Hast was one of the people as well. I think he filmed. <laughs> I think he filmed for a day or two. And you think, well, the, the amount of footage they've got, and you, you probably end up just using a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. um, um, it looked like, I mean, it was a good documentary, though. I really enjoyed it. But... I, I must admit, I've heard, I've heard good things about it, but I haven't seen it. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, good, it's good to hear. It's good to hear. Um, my kids get so sick of hearing about Titanic, though. I'm like, look, girls, there's a new, I put the video on YouTube and they're like, mom, stop it. <laughs> or like, oh, look, there's a new Titanic documentary on Disney Plus. They're like, no. <laughs> Dear. I suppose as long as you've got two televisions, you're all right. But, you know, but I want to watch it on the big TV in the living room. Yeah. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. Kids, with, with kids I'm telling you. Oh goodness! I don't have that problem yet. <laughs> it's like, it's like we just have cats. Um, oh, cats! Them. Cats all get in the way. Honestly, they crawl on your them. keyboard and. My, I have like the big TV has, um, you know, the screen saver. Like we have um, Roku, and it has a screen saver, and it's it looks like an aquarium. Oh, okay. Like, my cat's not really bright. She thinks that the the fish on the screen saver are real and she, she taps them i don't know i shouldn't tell all my secrets on on zoom sorry um no worries oh that's another that's a second cat kit for scott third one i'm oh, sorry I, i've lost track mark he has like 11 cats 11 oh goodness mm. that was i know see i just oh, i have one cat blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't have one myself. Most of the neighbours have one. There's so many cats in this neighbourhood. You'll always, you know, you'll always see them just fighting in the street or... Oh my goodness, we've digressed to cats. Anyway, well, yeah, I can cool. ask you. Um, all the ships have, like the ocean liners, they had cats, right? I mean, do you write about cats in any of your books? Like the importance of cats on ocean liners? I mean, um, since we've digressed to cats, you know? Oh, Honestly, oh, Mary oh had a, um, uh, yeah, I think I think Violet Jessup talked about a ship's cat for Titanic, and didn't didn't she say something about that the cat went ashore or something? Which I think she did, Titanic. but then it's unfounded. That. Nobody can confirm the cats on Titanic. It's like this big controversy. People get really heated, like about the cats on Titanic, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, I've no I, I've no idea if it's true or not. Um, I know. I know right? when. Um, you look at the late 1920s, um, there was a ship's cat on, um, some people call it Celtic, some people call it Celtic, um, when it was wrecked off, um, off Cove, off Queenstown in um, 1928. And there, there was, it made the New York Times, there, there was a ship's cat called Emily, and um, th there was a litter of kittens, I think, and um, you know, the, ship, the ship was wrecked, it was stranded, and you know they, they managed to get the passengers and crew off and it, eventually they salvaged all sorts of furniture and fittings um but yeah apparently the ship's cat refused to leave so and then there, there was allegedly a postcard or photo somewhere of this ship's cat oh. so i assume it was real 
Um, but you know, you, you think you think it would have wanted to leave the ship, given that it had been shipwrecked. But uh, but uh, yeah, I I, I, I like that story. I think I cut it, I cut it out. I've got this newspaper clipping, actually original um, original newspaper report, and um, use that as an illustration in the Big Four book, just because uh, just to mention the cat. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Also, um, Emily was a strange. Well, I suppose it. You know, I suppose it's fine as a cat's name. So. Fun fact: my cat's name is Violet. Oh, okay. Not after Violet Jessa. Oh. I am really a nerd. Okay. Um. My cat's name after Rosie off a of rose. Uh, off a of Titanic. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what to say. We're just like ship nerds i i don't know um anyway i think <laughs> ships and cats and i don't know um i really think you know the the titanic has really been in the news a lot lately um i'm sure that you've heard something about the marconi system everybody has an opinion about it do you have an opinion about it? Um, yeah, I know it's I know it's caused so much, um, you know, controversy. Um, I, to, to be honest, I, I don't I don't feel particularly strongly about it. Um, you know, I see you see arguments get so heated about the subject. Um, uh, I think there are some people that would wish, you know, the Titanic wreck had never been found, mm. you know, because they just don't want the ship disturbed in any way. Um, you know, from a point of view of history, I think we'd be much poorer if the wreck hadn't been found. Um, and, you know, there the are others that, you know, talk about um, uh, profiteering and, and, and so on. Um, but you know, I think if if we're going to if we're going to have artifacts from the ship, you know, to be displayed publicly, which you know I think does help to educate people and you know um, generate interest in the ship, uh, then it, it does it does need to be done through you know through private enterprise because you're certainly not going to get governments committing you know public money. Um, you know, for, for ventures of this sort, and um, you know, the, the responsibility to, to maintain those artifacts. Um, I mean, there've been, I think I'm right in saying there've been various bankruptcies or reorganizations of um, either RMS Titanic Inc. or, or predecessor companies. So um, I I don't think it's fair to say that you know that, that, that they're making a huge sum of money on this because actually it's very expensive to to mount expeditions and to um, you know to preserve the artifacts and to um, you know transport them you know and, and have them on display in various places. Um, I, I mean, I, I can kind of see both arguments. So I, I I I think one of the key concerns is that actually there is a window of time. So if if um, if it is to be salvaged successfully, then it needs to be done um, quite soon, um, and I, I think that adds an, another pressure to it. Um, and I, I guess who's to say that you know in in a year or two, um, for all we know, that you know the ship might have um, deteriorated um, since, since the area was last examined. So um, we won't necessarily know if it's possible. Um, so no, I, I don't. I don't feel too too strongly about it. I, I kind of think if you're if you're bringing up artifacts from you know from the ship for display, then I think that the, the, the wireless set is is particularly important historically. Um, I suppose a lot of the controversy is, you know, the, the fact that how it will be retrieved, you know, it's not something that's within the ship, it's not in the debris field or anything. Um, I mean, I think, I think on balance, I mean, if it is to be, if it is to be salvaged and then, you know, if there are, you know, the, the, the guarantees that it, it will be um, kept secure and, and displayed 
um, and um, you've got all those educational benefits, then um, I think that's a good thing. Um, equally, I completely understand, you know, the people that have got different opinions. Um, I, I do think part of it is Titanic related because there, there does seem to be a, a lot more passion about the subject compared to, for example, other shipwrecks where, um, you know, objects have been salvaged and there doesn't seem to be the same kind of heat, um, if I can put it that way. So uh, I suppose, you know, being high profile, um, you know, that, I think that's where a lot of this, a lot of this passion, a lot of this controversy comes from. I've noticed that too, you know, when you talk about artifact recovery from Titanic, it just, it's like this big explosion of, you know, um, you know, emotion and, you know, people just get so, you know, upset on both sides, you know, yes or no. And, you know, if it, if it was a different ship or, you know, say the pyramids or, you know, um, even here in Virginia, like, you know, an old plantation or even, you know, a battlefield or something like that, it would be totally different. But if you're talking about the Titanic, it's just like, you know, it, it just gets people really yeah, wound up, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I agree with you, Mark. I, I think that everything you said there is just very, uh, very sensible and well thought out. So, um, yeah, definitely. I'm all for education. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, instead of just going down there and just grabbing a bunch of like random things, it's much more, you know, um, I, I like the thought of preserving history, you know, actually going down and, 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 you know, recovering something that's, you know, got some historical value. So I, I think that's, um, you know, if they, if they are going to retrieve the Marconi system someday, I think that would be, um, you know, fantastic. So, you know, or anything from the debris field that's of historical value. I mean, they've got a bazillion plates and a bazillion bowls and cups and, you know, I mean, what it, they don't really need to recover any more of those. Um, but, you know, historical items are, are pretty neat. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? I know we've kept you here talking for a long time. I, I, you know, with, with these things, it, it's always once you're once you're on a, one of these meetings, the time time just flies. It just you know feels like we've only just started. To be honest, um, so um, no, not 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 particularly. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions, but um, I suppose we can uh, I suppose we can bring it to a natural close. All right. Well, um, Kipper and I and um, all of the admin team for both Fox Star Line and RMS Titanic Reflections, we certainly do appreciate you joining us today. And um, we appreciate you um, just talking with us and answering our questions. And um, I'm sure our group members have appreciated it. We'll probably share it around a little bit more. And yeah. um, we'd love to have you back sometime, you know, um, yeah, that would be good. And yeah. time in the future, if we, you know, have some more questions from our group members or something, we maybe make a little collection of them and you know, talk about some different topics. But we've really enjoyed it. It's been really nice getting to know you. Kipper has a question. He's got to say it up. Sam LK wants to know if he, if Mark is aware or aware or when it's possible to find the communication between the island of Malta and the Olympic during World War One. Um, is this in sorry, is this in terms of, um, how is, is this like for a particular voyage or, um, is it messages? I'm guessing both, if you know anything about it. Um, not, uh, I think I'd, I'd probably have to respond to the question with a question and just say specifically, what are you? Um, yeah, I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure what what they're asking there. Sorry. Um, I mean, may, maybe, maybe um, you know, if it's posted to the group or something, and then um, that might be uh, that might be an option. Um, 
Well, I do have a question actually. Um, have you ever been to a Titanic museum or have you ever touched it, like an artifact? Have you ever like do you have any collections of your own or? Um, I have been. I've been to well, I've been to various museums that have got exhibits on. So you know, Southampton Maritime Museum up to up to in Belfast, uh, Merseyside Maritime Museum. Um, I did see the travelling um, exhibits. Um, the, the you know recovered artifacts from the wreck um, when they were in the Netherlands. Um, I think about six years ago. Um, so that was very good to you know to see artifacts firsthand. So uh, yeah, really enjoyed that. And you know you you see people just going around and looking at them, and you can just see that they're getting interested in the subject. So um, you know I suppose that's I suppose that's part of you know, seeing the educational benefit of, um, of the artifacts that we have got. It's amazing. I want to go see the, some of the artifacts someday. I think that would just be just, a, you know, an amazing experience. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It is. Uh, I've, I've been to a traveling Titanic museum when I was in California and they were just about to leave and I got to see the whistles. I got to see some of the money they recovered from down there. Um, there was actually a model of a grand staircase and I actually was coming down it and I fell. Uh, but <laughs> um, because it was too like, you know, they an exact copy and it was so like small like going down it. I'm like, man, man must have been smaller back then. Bless your heart. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anything else? Are there any more questions or anything for anybody? Nobody? Anybody? I think was at work, I guess. Huh? So I'm guessing some people were at work or they were just, I don't know. It's just, anyway. it's just tricky, isn't it? Because, you, you you know, we're all in different time zones and it's just not possible yeah. to, you know, Nigel had to go to work and I know, in, <laughs> I guess in the afternoon, you know, where you are, there'll be people working as well. So it's just... Okay. Yeah. People will watch this. Um, I mean, it's amazing The the views will start picking up like you know, as people have free time, they'll go back and watch the I don't know how it's going to work with it being two separate videos. Is it two? Or do we get to three in the end? I can't remember. I don't um, our tech guy, though, he can. Um, our actual our tech guy is from Chile. Our admin teams are so diverse. It's great. We have people from New Zealand, Chile, Kippers from Louisiana. I'm from Virginia. Oh, what? We have people from all over the place. It's Eric, it's fantastic. I think Eric's in Michigan. Canada, everywhere. Our admin teams for our Facebook groups. California. Um, California. It's Michigan. it's great. They're Titanic and ocean liner enthusiasts all over the world. But anyway, so our tech guy from Chile, he can probably put the two videos together so that when we post it on YouTube, it'll be fair enough. It'll be one yeah. video. Yeah, we share the link. We'll share the link when we get it put together. But um, but Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone for watching. We hope everyone has a great weekend. Yeah, have a good one, so even if you're working. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Cheers, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. It was your pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.